Okay, let's go over custom designs in classic Battletech and what you need to know in order to be successful. So, um, custom designs are a very contentious subject when it comes to classic Battletech. Um, lots of players are drawn to building custom designs, um, but a lot of older players or players with experience tend not to like it. Um, however, if you ask me, um, it's a big draw to the game. Um, it was a big part of the uh, video games, which I would argue actually drew a lot of people into um, classic Battletech. Usually when I talk to players, most people are playing things like Mech Warrior, uh, the Mech Warrior 5 series or the Battletech 2018 series, and then really love it and decide to kind of try out the original, uh, the original tabletop game. It's a big draw, makes it very unique compared to a game like, um, Warhammer 40k, which has very limited war gear options. Um, it's really more of like a fourth edition, um, uh, chaos uh, Chaos Rulebook, if you're familiar with that, or Chaos Codex, where you can really um, trick out your mechs and you really do um, a lot of really fun and creative things. Um, I, and I would say that because the video games are a big part of the resurgence of Battletech, um, I, I think you should we, should we should let it in and it should be part of the experience. So what is the best way to make customs? What is the best way to approach customs? Um, I would say the best way to learn is actually understand completely how to break the game. And then um, once we have a complete understanding of how to bust it wide open, um, then we want to kind of pull it back and self-nerf. But we want to understand um, everything we need to do to break the game and then um, put some self-limitations. I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, ultimately, Battletech is a game from the 90s, classic Battletech, with more creativity and, um, and breakability. It's really trusting you to do uh, the right thing, right? Um, the classic example is a game like uh, Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 edition, where I think if you're able to take the right um, feats and skills, you're able to create uh, Pun Pun, which is essentially a level 5 kobold god that can reach across uh, dimensions and hit things, right? So it's really uh, more on that level rather than the kind of more modern, um, stricter, limited rule set. So why don't Grognards like customs? Basically, power gamers um, can take things too far and uh, make things unfun. Um, ultimately, with this conversation, I'm going to show you how to um, completely break the game. And I only can suggest that you kind of self-nerf. So there's only so much I can do. But I think I'm going to trust you with that knowledge. All right. So ultimately, the goal here is to design for fairness and fun. It's not, not a really big secret that battle value 2 is not ex, uh, is not balanced, and it's a large reason why my videos are not rating for it. I'm balancing on C-Bills rather than BB2. I just don't want um, things to be an optimizing fest, ultimately, um, and I felt if I did balance for BB2 um, rather than C-Bills, it would, it would encourage power gaming and, and more tournament-level play, where I am more interested in exploring the narrative. Um, and I'm not really interested in kind of min-maxing and stuff like that. Certainly are if you if you are into tournaments, you definitely do want to try and pick um, the best mechs per BV2. But that's just not my thing um, at the end of the day, okay? So our agenda today is um, I'm going to show you some successful design archetypes, some things to keep in mind um, when we go about designing mechs. Then I'm going to show you the mechanics of how to kind of break the game. And then once we know how to break the game, we're going to uh, go over some ideas on how you can self-regulate, how you can um, still keep the game fun, um, you know, with you and your opponent. Okay, starting off with design archetypes. So let's get a kind of big picture idea of what we want to make, what kind of mech we want to design. Um, specifically, let's look at some patterns on what's common and successful, and then maybe base a, um, our own variant or our own design off of that. So the first thing we can look at is roles, um, something we've gone over already in the last video as well as in the Beginner's Master Any Mech. We've covered this. Um, the first thing you can do is design for a role. But additionally, there are a few uh, themes that kind of reoccur uh, throughout um, Battletech machines that we can see. And um, we want to use this as kind of inspiration but on top of that, there are also a few themes uh, that we see across multiple designs and we can use to kind of um, as inspiration to come up with um, our new mech idea. So let's go over that. So the first um, archetype is usually in the scout class. Um, it's the fast kicker. These are very cheap mobile mechs that uh, primarily kick mechs for uh, kick mechs for value. And I didn't do uh, didn't know about this too much when I was like making the light tier list a while ago. But really, the spider and the Oscout, scout these kind of mechs aren't using their lasers as their primary attack. They're using the kick as a primary attack and forcing um, piloting rolls. These are used as initiative sinks in the classic Battletech game. 
Um, so, so they have kind of a dual purpose, right? They're cheap enough to be used as initiative sinks, and then they can kind of kick to kind of punch up. So things like the Spider 5D and Auscout uh, 7J are really big value mechs. Um, are, are really the best fast kickers. And then things like the Locust and Assassin are even capable of doing this. The other archetype in the Scout class is the Scout Striker. These are more heavily armed, but semi-cheap mechs. They're still flexible. They can use the initiative sync, but they can also strike, right? So they have um, these missiles, these lasers, um, so they can, they can use the strike maneuver um, better than their lighter cousins can. Um, I think the Vulcan 5T, if you ask me, is a big sleeper, especially with the narrow low profile. I really like it with its multiple uh, medium lasers. Moving on to cavalry, the next uh, archetype is the jump pulse archetype. Um, jumping basically is helping with their defense, right? It increases the uh, their evasion and then um, helps them maneuver into the right spot. And then the pulse lasers are helping compensate for uh, the accuracy loss for running and jumping. These make some very good light hunters, particularly if they're a little bit more heavy. Um, things like the Wraith TR1 is kind of the premium option. Um, jump 7 gets really, really busted. It's definitely one of the more stronger archetypes to design around. Things like the Vapor Eagle um, for the clan side um, is very, very good for this. And then the Star League Crab 27 SL with um, is also Jump Pulse, 585 Jump Pulse with, uh, I believe, an XL engine. But it's not too bad since you're uh, kind of moving it around. The other cavalry archetype is the melee archetype. Um, these are mechs with good tonnage, decent armor, and bad weapons. So... Um, what you're doing with these mechs is just running them straight in. Um, you can even eject ammunition off of mechs like the Shadowhawk 2H and the Dragon 1N, and they're basically running in to, to get value, okay? These are cheap BV um, mechs that are essentially used as distraction carnifixes or things that your opponent has to respond to. Um, when it gets to narrative play or the RPG kind of game, I could definitely see how the Dragon and the Shadowhawk can be used as fire support, but when things kind of, ranges kind of close and with the classic tabletop, um, sorry, the classic tabletop experience, I really don't think the Shadowhawk and the Dragon bring enough damage to the table um, to, to make a difference. I think the fight is over if you kind of keep them out, um, out at range a lot of the time. So I really would suggest um, just kind of running them in as kind of shock troops um, and, and ejecting the ammo, if you ask me. Okay, so moving on to the battle line. Um, the first battle line archetype is the flex range archetype. These are mechs that are pretty tanky. Um, they have brawl weapons, but they also have an LRM system and typically like an AC AC10, sorry, an AC10 or a large laser to give them some medium range and long range punch. This means they can reasonably fight at any range and makes them very flexible. They can play into pretty much any composition they need to. Um, and still get some kind of um, some kind of value. In an LRM composition, they'd be used as the kind of front line, but also be able to kind of play back um, with the range mechs, which makes them, you know, useful in that regard. The other battle line archetype is the energy tank. Um, these are only energy mechs with a very good armor and a standard engine, right? They don't have the XL engine, so um, makes them a lot more durable. These are mechs... Um, it, Mechs of this archetype are extremely hard to destroy because there's no explosion chance anywhere on the mech. And then the standard engine, um, again, makes them very tanky because the, they, they, you know, if they lose a torso, they don't take any engine hits, okay? Moving on, um, this next archetype is the single range archetype. This can be used on any mech. Um, these are mechs that have a single range bracket they want to get to. Um, they typically are a little bit more needy. They need protection or to be enabled. So things like the Griffin and Archer here really want to be fighting at long range. They don't want to be using their punches or lasers um, to, to get value. They really want to be at range. So they need um, protection from kind of frontline guys or bodyguards. And then the things like the Hunchback and the King Crab really need to be enabled by their Lance Mates to get into uh, medium range with their AC-20s. Um, so they can, you know, so they can um, be valuable. They're not really, they're not really good um, outside of that range. Okay, um, these mechs are a little bit predictable and can kind of show your opponent what your plans are, so um, be careful here. Contrasting this is the swap range archetype. These are mechs with both ranged and brawl weapons. So um, classic example here is the Warhammer with its PPCs it starts a fight with, and then it can swap over to its brawl mode. Same thing with the, um, this is not the Orion, this is the Crusader, uh, the Crusader with LRM 15s. And then um, it can swap over to its SRMs and medium lasers. They typically don't have enough heat sinks to do um, both jobs at once. And they may have um, defensive issues, right? The Warhammer has a lot of ammunition and classically low armor. The, uh, 
the Crusader here has, um, I think, a 100% chance to explode on the side torso. So these are kind of swap range things. A, a lot of people um, are sleeping, in my opinion, on this trebuchet here um, with the LRMs, and then it's swapping to the medium lasers. Um, typically with a trebuchet, you're like unloading your LRMs as fast as possible and then swapping over to the medium lasers. But very, um, very fun um, mech that I want to experiment with more. Um, I, I think it has potential. All right, yeah, so they're swapping back and then moving forward. Um, related to this archetype is the missile skirmishing archetype. These are mechs that are have ranged and brawl weapons, but they also have speed. It's harder to use these mechs in the optimal way, um, but if they win initiative, you can pick the range which your enemy is weakest and maneuver into that spot to get good trades. And if you lose initiative, you can just kind of stand there and trade, okay? So this is a very um, fun, uh, very versatile um, way to play. Probably if I was playing in a campaign, I would look to maybe play one of these catapult C ones if I kind of wanted to challenge myself and wanted kind of a cool rare mech. The next archetype is the Inferno mech. These are mechs that um, carry two tons of Inferno ammunition with the same launchers. So two SRM6s here on the Orion. Um, it's two SRM4s. The Kantara has uh, SRM6s. And then the Trebuchet 5S, I believe, has SRM6s. So if you ever see things with the same launcher and at least two tons of ammo, you can pull this off. What you do is you carry one ton of regular ammunition and one ton of Inferno ammunition, and then you can use that Inferno ammunition um, to crowd control, reduce incoming damage, and um, fight off combined arms fairly well. See our weapons guide if you want to know more about that archetype. The next archetype that you can design a mech around is the Pierce Crit archetype. These are mechs with both a piercing and a critical hit weapon. Um, it makes them very easy to slot into lances because they're self-sufficient, right? So the uh, Warhammer breaks uh, armor with its PPCs and then follows up with its uh, follows up with his SRMs. The Alice here has the AC-20 to pop open armor, and then it has its SRMs to follow up. And then the Osrock is also a quite valuable mech, in my opinion, even though it has the um, risky center torso ammo. It has two large laser for the pierce, and then has an SRM uh, for, for the follow-up crit. These mechs, I think, tend to make good duelists because they have everything you need to take on another mech and win. The final archetype is the command mech archetype. These are mechs that just have the command mech quirk. Um, they're adding a bonus to the team's initiative. They're quite useful here. Um, I would recommend carrying uh, at least one in a formation if you're using this quirk. Um, classic picks are the Phoenix Hawk 1, the Wolverine 6R, and the Archer 2R. There are some um, more rare mechs like the Marauder, the Black Knight, and the Mongoose, I think, that have it as well. Um, Atlas and King Crab also have the command mech, but those are, get a little bit expensive. But... Consider running at least a couple of these in a campaign if you're using the Quirk, um, or if you're playing with Quirks in a single game, um, consider making one of your mechs uh, one of these guys, because it definitely does help. Okay, so now that we have an idea of what we might want to go about designing, um, how do we make it? How do we, uh, how do we break the game? What are the mechanics we need to know in order to make the most OP design we possibly can? Um, and the, the idea here is if I show you how to make um, an unfun mech, uh, you'll pretty much not want to do it, right? Um, and then if it's no longer a challenge, uh, you'll be more inclined to take on the next challenge, which is how do we design something um, that's unique but also fun? All right, so the big secret here is um, you already have most of the tools you need in order to build a very powerful design. Um, most of the concepts were already covered in previous videos, so if, you, you know, if you've watched them, you can just apply the lessons you've learned um, from a design aspect, right? So you can look at like um, lances, like what do I need to fit into this lance, right? Uh, this concept of um, the mech as a package. If you're going for a melee mech, maybe you can design a mech that is going for head caps. Maybe you want to design something um, with, you know, the exact tonnage you need to um, one shot a mech in the cockpit if you ever get above it. If you're going for heat, maybe you want to design um, net heat plus two, or maybe a mech that can go net heat plus seven and then uh, minus seven, right? just to play under the negative bonuses, right, kind of perfectly. And if you're coming off of weapons, maybe you want to, you know, pick some efficient weapons or understand um, how the weapons kind of play together and um, can affect a lance composition, right? So you're just applying these from a design standpoint. We only really need a few other things. Um, we basically need the structure, which we're going to cover in this video, and then the armor piece, which we're going to cover in this video. We're going to learn how to optimize and evaluate um, armor and structure. And then moving forward, you know, if you're going forward in the, into 3039 and 3050, maybe you want to look at future weapons, which will be a future video. And then our next video, I believe, is going to be uh, movement. Although you should already have an understanding of how movement works by just looking at the lances video and the mech rolls video, right? Um, a lot of these mechs have um, very similar speeds depending on their function. 
All right, so moving into structure, um, structure's job is to protect key components from critical hit events, all right? So each time their uh, mech takes a damage to structure, there is a 58% uh, chance of no critical, 25% uh, chance of one critical occurring, 13.9% uh, chance of two criticals occurring, and 2.8% chance of three criticals or that limbs gets blown off. So we want to be protecting against these events. Um, the main way we do this is padding a location. So this is adding non-essential components to a location. So we're stuffing that location um, with flamers, small lasers, medium lasers, machine guns, heat sinks, jump jets, that sort of thing. Um, and that reduces the chance an important um, critical component gets hit. So I'll show you here. Um, here's the Crusader 3R. It only has one ton of ammunition in the left torso, which makes there's a 100% chance to crit. So if there's a crit in the right torso, you're basically rolling again until you hit this ammo and it's going to go up in flames. Versus um, something like the Warhammer 6R, which has a bunch of these um, smaller weapon systems and it is still protecting a single ton of ammunition like the Crusader, but only has a 17 chance to 17% chance to explode, right? And that's how you do it. So again, with padding a location, you can also use it to pad out a main weapon. Here we're looking at the Centurion A's um, AC-10, which is a very big, bulky weapon, 70% chance to get crit. But if we look at the variant, the AL variant, there's only a 33% chance of crit, right, with this uh, large laser. But you definitely want to be careful uh, about how far you can take this. I think um, there, you can definitely overdo it. On mechs like uh, Custom Designs, if you look at the Battlemaster video on the Armanius, I think I definitely took it too far. Um, after kind of play, playing it in a campaign, definitely too strong. So yeah, be, be careful. One of the tactics you can do in a game is eject ammunition. So this removes the explosion chance um, of, a, uh, of a location. Um, you want to do this before range is closed. So when you're playing a game, um, here we have the uh, Thunderbolt uh, standard loadout here. But then um, as range is closed, the Thunderbolt can choose to increase its defense by ejecting the center torso ammunition or the right torso ammunition, right? Um, typically, you want to keep about 8 to 12 rounds for one fight. So maybe you're entering the game with only, you know, 8, eight rounds of shooting for this SRM2 for a single fight. You don't need all these 50. And maybe that will save you eventually if you do take a crit there, right? Um, this is also a reason why it's very hard to, I guess, um, balance for AC5s and AC2s, SRM4s and SRM2s, because they just have too much ammo for a, for a single fight. It more comes into play when you're doing, like, campaigns and stuff like that. Another design choice is um, having your weapon in the arm. Um, this increases the kind of range or the attack range of your weapon, right? So you hear the Wolverine has a large laser in the right arm, and it can shoot all the way out to here, which helps it um, if mechs try and get around it or flank it. It does make the mech harder to defend, though, right? So any torso loss, so if the uh, Wolverine loses its right torso, it also loses the arm, making it um, kind of vulnerable in that way. And it forces us to kind of spread out armor, which we'll be going over next, okay? Um, you also can't grab things in, uh, in, a, in a raid scenario or kind of that if that mission type comes up. One of the other design choices you might run into is should I um, put my heat sinks into my legs or should I use them in like the torsos and arms to kind of crit pad? If you ask me, um, when I play games, I like to go for general triggers rather than specific triggers. So I like to design for um, things that happen a lot. So I get a lot of triggers and a lot of value off of that rather than things that happen specifically. So um, if you ask me, while water on legs is very good and can improve the damage of your mech, um, it has a lower chance than um, just, you know, just getting a crit, right? Um, you have to be in a um, map that has water, and then you have to be able to maneuver in that water in order to get that benefit. Whereas if you're fighting, um, it's a lot more, right, a lot more common that um, you're going to get punched, and then uh, you're going to need to start defending from crit. So if you ask me, I would use my heat sinks to crit pad. All right, so now that we have structure, let's cover armor. Um, keep in mind, maneuver is actually the best way to defend, um, but sooner or later, you're going to take a hit, and you're going to need armor. So armor's job is to prevent critical hit triggers, um, and what we want to do, what we want to do is just prevent da uh, damage from getting into structure, and we want to fully protect that um, without waste. So we're going to go through an example here. This is an example of a wasp or a stinger, I believe, um, and this is a wasted armor example, right? So again, armor's job is to prevent critical hits. So we need to ask ourselves the question, what then is the best armor value to have? And this is the kind of the worst um, armor value here. So this is a Locust with four armor. It takes a medium laser hit, and then it immediately um, that medium laser goes through the armor into the center torso and triggers a crit, right? Or could potentially trigger a hit crit. It also has four armor on every location, so a hit to the leg will also potentially trigger a crit. And it also has one armor on the head, which means a headshot with a medium laser will completely destroy the mech. So obviously, this is not a great 
armor value to have. Four armor is not a great armor value to have. So given that armor's job is to protect from critical hits, uh, what is the best armor value to have? Um, well, we can see here that uh, four armor points isn't that great, right? A single medium laser is going to be able to punch through, trigger a critical, and you essentially waste four armor points, right? This, these four armor pretty much did nothing uh, to protect the mech from a critical hit. We can see that um, with six armor points, you do protect from a medium laser shot, so that's not too bad. You just waste uh, one armor point here. With seven points of armor, you also protect against a medium laser shot, um, but when it comes to the large laser that does eight points of damage, uh, the seven points of armor is defeated, and the mech does take a crit. With nine points of armor, you are protected from the large laser, but you're not protected from something like a PPC or an AC-10 shot. So here, you waste the whole nine points of armor. whole nine points of armor gets defeated. With 10 points of armor, you're good against a PPC shot, um, AC-10 shot, or two medium laser shots. So. so the next thing we have to ask ourselves then is um, what weapons are the most frequent? Uh, and we could do a frequency analysis to find this out, but I like to think in multiples of five. I think this is a good way to think of things uh, in 3025 at least, right? So when we think about how much to armor, um, you can think about things in multiples of five. Um, so the things that come in multiples of five are the very common medium laser, uh, the AC-5, and the LRM attacks in packets of five. Um, if you think in this way, if you think in this way, uh, the PPC and the AC-10 are doing kind of two HP worth of damage, right? They're doing um, two, two packets of 10, two times five is 10. The AC-10 is also doing uh, 10. The AC-20 is doing four damage, right? Four packets of five. And then the large laser, we just round up um, because it's doing eight. We just round up to, uh, to 10. Weapons that would do half damage, if we're thinking like this, would be the SRM um, that does two points, and then a any spare packet of LRM uh, damage would do one to four damage, so we can just kind of round that to a packet um, to, to half damage. So now that we know how much we should armor, uh, where should we armor, right? And certain um, areas of a mech, certain zones of a mech, are more, uh, more important than others, right? We want to protect against um, headshots, ammo crits, center torso destruction, and leg destruction. Any location that does not have uh, one of these components should be considered non-essential. And also any uh, area that has a main weapon, like an AC-20 or something like that, something that, we, uh, that the whole mech is built around, is something we want to protect. All right, so with this understanding, um, how should we go about arming a mech? And we're going to go through the steps now. So the first step is I would pick the amount of damage I want to protect in the rear. I want to select which weapon I want to protect against. So here I have a Black Knight. Um, with the left and right torso, I want to protect against a medium laser shot, so I'm just uh, allocating a packet of five. Again, in the center torso, I want to protect against um, a medium laser shot, a large laser shot, um, or a uh, medium laser shot and maybe an SRM. So I'm armoring eight here. I select eight as the value. If anything comes around with um, armor value, or sorry, penetration value of 10, I'm defeated, but I'm just accepting that. So like a um, AC-10 or something like that. The next step is to pick the amount of armor for the head. So um, the formula here is any specific weapon um, minus two. So if we want to protect against a PPC shot, we'd armor eight. If we want to protect against a large laser shot, we'd armor uh, six. If we go down to five armor, then we're protecting against a medium laser shot and a follow-up SRM. Uh, really, if we want to start budgeting, this is really only for light mechs. If we want to just protect against a medium laser shot, uh, we would armor four or three. And we also want to consider melee, right? So if we want to protect against a 100-tonner uh, head hitting us in the head, then we armor 8, right? 80-tonner will be 6 armor, so on and so forth. Um, really, you're kind of cutting it close when you get down to this 3 armor. I would probably consider uh, 4 as the lowest for a light mech unless I really, really wanted to budget. Okay, so after that, uh, we move on to step 3. We take our remaining armor points, and then we allocate um, according to how much we want to protect each zone. So this is the hit table allocated by percentages. So the center torso here will be taking um, between 20 and 14% um, of the incoming hits. And so we want to armor um, according to that. So because we want to protect uh, the center torso here, I allocated 20% of the remaining armor points so that uh, the center torso is one of the last components to fail. Um, the legs here we can see will take um, between 11% and 
uh, 20 percent of the shots because the leg is so important i decided to allocate 15 percent the torsos here take about uh 14 to 20 percent depending on facing so i decided to allocate 15 percent so you would, you would consider allocating more if the mech uh was running more ammo but i think with a black knight it's a pretty much an all energy build it's an energy tank build so it's not really important and the arms here i'm um going light on the armor because it doesn't have um really important weapons in the arms it does have the uh large laser with the l variant or the ppc but it can still um fight reasonably well without use of the arms so i'm only allocating 10 percent even though uh for the arms it's going to be we're expecting about 14 percent to 90 percent of the damage coming in there but it'll be fine we can uh we can live without our arms okay so this is what it looks like after the allocation and then the last uh last thing to do is to make adjustments so we're uh, moving things up and down um in packets of five right so um in this previous example here we had 22 armor on the right leg um and 22 on the torsos and then 16 in the arms we just did a bit of an adjustment so that uh we put a little bit more into the uh into the legs and we're round up to packets of five and then the torsos again were uh, i didn't consider too important so we just rounded down uh from 22 to 20 and then we popped off this um this armor in the arms at 16 and then we push it into the leg so we can make a nice even packet of five and that's how i would go about um, min maxing the armor of a mech so now that we know how to min max or how to kind of break the game um let's go move on to balancing right um how do we not break the game how do we uh introduce fun and make it still engaging for um us and an opponent to play now keep in mind i'm not a game designer or a balancer uh i'm just you know um, a hobbyist so i think maybe someone might have a more professional opinion than i do but these are just my thoughts so first off um how many custom mechs should we have um we still want everyone to have a good time and um in my opinion i think maximum you would want um one custom per 12 mechs seems to be a good um good idea uh in the last campaign i played we had about 16 mechs and then we ran one custom uh one custom design each and that was kind of a way to ensure that well there was some creativity but there wasn't an overwhelming amount of craziness going on um thing you can do is to increase battle value to compensate right so uh programs like mega mech will automatically calculate uh battle value for you but what you can do is add on like a bit of a tax like a 10 percent or 20 percent uh tax to your customs just to make sure that you know uh things that don't get out of hand Another thing to keep in mind in classic Battletech is that ammunition in legs and head is quite rare, even though it's standard practice in games like uh, Mech Warrior 5 and Mech Warrior Online. Um, yeah, quite rare to have um, ammunition in legs, heads, uh, and sometimes you'll see in the arms, but yeah, um, you probably want to introduce a bit of vulnerability there. You also don't want to have mismatch armor locations. It's also something I've not seen. Uh, a mistake I did on my previous videos with the custom designs um, is mismatching armor, but uh, don't really do that. So have the same amount of armor on your both legs and same amount of armor on your arms and torsos. Places you can take inspiration from. Um, Battle 20, Battletech 2018 hard points are not bad, but I do think that the Mech Warrior 5 hard points are maybe a little bit better, a little bit more strict. Um, I don't think strictness is necessarily a bad thing. It introduces some interesting creativity, um, forces you to think creatively um, with fewer kind of uh, levers to pull, right? And then you also can look at existing canon designs. So kind of look along the timeline for maybe what was possible, um, what, you know, people in the lore were able to do with that design and, you know, use that as kind of a guideline. One of the more fun things to do is also look at lore or use lore as a limitation. So maybe looking at what the strongest lore variant is and using that as a yardstick, not really going over that or having a very good reason for going over that or adding additional battle value. Um, just using, you know, what was already published out there as a reference point. Um, you kind of want to think about availability, uh, refit type, right? Um, if you are refitting, you know, how, how intensive is that refit going to be? What the total money spent is? Um, the availability of equipment for an era, like who you're designing for, um, and maybe the original design concept, uh, keeping that in mind. So I'll show an example of what I mean here. Um, my design concept is I want to create, let's say, mercenary designs that incorporate um, Helm Memory Core tech, right? So I want to move up my timeline, and I still want to design for um, these rugged mercenaries. What would that mean? Well, that would mean that I would probably have to design my mechs in a... a mercenary friendly successor state so somewhere like the federated commonwealth or uh maybe the free worlds league um classically the Dracon lore wise the draconis combine is not too friendly with mercs and so i probably wouldn't design from there so maybe i would 
um, you know, use tech that's only created in the Federated Commonwealth, um, or maybe mostly tech from the Federated Commonwealth and a little smattering of some other states. Um, I would limit my technology that way. In thinking about it, mercenaries also would want to keep things like very affordable. So it'd be really hard to, you know, sell them entirely new design. So maybe I would want to keep um, the refit cost to no more than 10% of the original mech. They would probably want good durability and logistics since they're a for-profit organization. So I probably wouldn't uh, slap in an Excel engine because that make the, uh, not only would it skyrocket the cost, but it would also make the mech very vulnerable. Um, I would have a limited amount of ferrofibrous armor since they would constantly need to replenish that. And when limited logistics are an issue, uh, I don't see ferrofibrous being something that uh, mercenaries would you know use all the time since it is um, hard to replenish. And then maybe I would only design for common mechs, right? Mechs that are commonly available. I probably wouldn't make any um, adjustments to some rare mechs. I would only focus on um, mechs that mercenaries would usually come across, right? So that would kind of set some design challenges or some guidelines for me as I um, built out my own custom mech factory uh, for my own lore. Anyway, thanks for listening. Um, lecture notes are on the Discord, and I will see you next time.